Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and today we're talking offset smoker fire management and why some of the best advice on YouTube doesn't translate to popular backyard offset sizes. So I've got four of the most common backyard sizes, whether it be 30 gallons, 60 gallons, 85 gallons, and 110 gallons, to show how four common setups translate to backyard offset smokers. So let's meet the backyard offsets that I'm using for today's uh, comparison. If you happen to have the exact same one, you can follow along at home. But since this video is about translating advice and tips and techniques to get the result that you want out of your backyard smoker, you might have to do the same that I'm doing here today and make some adjustments to make sure you get the performance that you're looking. Because I can already, spoiler alert, tell you that some of the tips and techniques shared for a thousand gallon offset smoker just do not translate to a small backyard patio offset. This video is not sponsored by any brand or manufacturer, even though I have four offsets. This is for a temporary period. Barbecue. And today... James. Seriously? So the crash course on how and why I have four. Uh, my oldest offset is two years old. It's my Carlisle Generation 1 offset by Smoke North. I bought this when I was considering and looking at the Franklin Backyard uh, offset pit. After about a year of being on the wait list, I gave up and found this as an alternative and I absolutely love it. I was drawn to this 60 gallon size because originally I thought I could fit it under my outdoor kitchen area and I didn't want it to take up too much space. Uh, but flash forward two years and I find myself wanting a little bit more space in the four racks of ribs or so that I can fit on there. At about the two year mark, I started to hear a rumor of a second generation coming out. And before I wanted to spend the money, one of the things I love testing on my channel is inexpensive options versus expensive options. And many times it's about a 50-50 split in terms of the inexpensive option can compete just as well as options costing far more. And so before I doubled down and got another premium backyard offset smoker last year, just before the holiday, Days, I found Oklahoma Joe's on clearance and Highland offset smoker at Lowe's. I picked that up and I put it through a bunch of tests, including some mods that you'll see on it, like my semi-insulated firebox, an air intake relocation, as well as an extended chimney. And I love it for the money, even though, again, if you have one of these, it is, and smaller offsets like this, one of the most difficult to use as compared to the bigger models in terms of managing your temperatures. And I'll share some advice how to uh, overcome that. And then, uh, since I wasn't sure uh, which model I wanted to go for, I was able to convince uh, my wife to get both under the guarantee that I sell three out of the four by May. So that's how we got to four backyards uh, in the offset. So now let's get into the four most common fires that are shared by some of the internet's most popular offset fire management teachers. So since it'll be easier out here to demonstrate the four different fires that we're going to build, let me walk you through four of the most common methods shared online and who shared them. So first I'm going to start with the Jerby method, which uh, in his video, if you've seen that, he'll highlight not to do something like this H pattern as what we're going to get is uh, too much airflow with really high flames. And this is absolutely true. If you go for campfire lattice sort of structure here, we're going to get a high flame and it's going to draft into our cook chamber and that's going to be at the risk of crisping up whatever it is that we're cooking and we don't want crispy briskets. So his uh, fix for this is to tighten up our log. So we have a bit of our coal bed down below and then uh, working a fire near the door so we have more clearance is to build a fairly tight three to four log pattern on top. And so this is a bit of a knockdown fire. And uh, he claims here that this will not only help keep the flames lower, but you'll get much more longevity out of your fire. So we're definitely going to uh, test that. Uh, Mad Scientist, uh, let's do him next. He does a bit of the opposite of this, where his common approach is to go across the firebox with three logs on the bottom, right over the coal bed after that's been raked out. And then depending on the target temperature that he wants to achieve in the pit, it's going with one, two, or three logs right across the top. Next, let's move into uh, Chud's barbecue. So Chud uh, gets a little bit closer to some of the fires that uh, work in a really, really small offset where he'll take his coal bed, bank it to one side so this log is nestled in nice and tight, and then put a log in a bit of a teepee pattern across that. And to try and uh, expose the bottom of the log to the coal bed, uh, he suggests going on a bit more of an angle like that. So we've got a long, prolonged area of exposing it uh, with plenty of room for airflow to come into your pit. And then last but not least is the Joe Yim method, which is more of the mark of Zorro here. So if we were looking down, you see this Z pattern where you've got 
two logs on the bottom, your coal bed in the middle, and then on a diagonal across a, a third log. So now that we understand the four different fires uh, that are shared most common in some of the most popular fire management videos, let's apply them into different size offsets and see how they perform. So game plan, to get all of our offsets up to temperature, I'm gonna use some kiln dried grocery store birch wood along with a little bit of fogo charcoal. I like to use a little bit of charcoal, just toss it in the bottom underneath our fire and then go with a few pieces of birch. So when I hit it with my grill blazer grill gun, we're up to nice clean flames in under about 30 seconds to max a minute. This is gonna help us overshoot our temperature. We might see you know, 400 degrees or so uh, on our gauge, but it's quickly going to settle in and that's just going to help get anywhere from 200 to 600, 800, 950 pounds of steel heat soaked and up to temperature. And that's when we're gonna jump in to our fire management. For keeping things consistent, I'm using the exact same wood in all four, which is going to be oak from the same destination. So this is not kiln dried, but this is naturally seasoned. This is uh, buying this bag stuff is a lot more expensive, but when you're just learning and picking up, this could be one of the best things uh, for honing in your skills. If you always grab different wood, different moisture levels, uh, different varieties of wood, uh, it can throw you for a loop. So this is a, a piece of advice that I would recommend for anyone looking to hone their offset fire management skills is to find a wood supplier, at least for the short period uh, while you're learning and stick with it. It will make your life so much easier. Plus something like this, they all come in a fairly uniform size uh, and consistency so that we are not going to have uh, any differences. The only con to this is again, as we go up in size, I can get away with burning larger splits in a 28 inch firebox and I can in a 24 inch firebox. But enough about that, let's build our four most common fires. Okay, let's start with the Jerby fire, which is gonna be placing two logs running lengthways of our pit with our coal bed in the middle. And then using the flat side of the log, place that right down on top and we're gonna stack these close together. Okay, in about a minute, those have all caught. So let's close our top door since we are drafting out and we'll go add a temperature probe onto our gauge so we can track the temperature and take a look at the fire in a couple minutes. Okay, I've placed a probe in the middle. We'll give that a couple minutes to come up to temperature so we can keep track of how each fire performs. So on our 60 gallon, we're gonna do the mad scientist approach with three logs across like this. And do the minimum one log on top. So now that those have caught, let's get a probe and log the temperature in the pit. So on my 85 gallon, I'm gonna do the chud fire, which is banking the coals to one side, nestling a log in there, and then going with a horizontal across the coal bed in order to help give uh, more surface area. Okay, that's caught. Let's go record the great temp. Okay, so here we're gonna be building the Joe Yim Zorro style fire by placing our two logs with our coal bed pushed in the middle and then making a Z pattern. So you can either, well, we'll do it that way so that we get air in this way. So there's our Z. Let's let that come up to temperature. Looks good, let's go record great temps. So as we saw there, none of our four fire setups were able to achieve the low and slow temperatures that we might be after, whether it be 225, 250, 270. Uh, more often than not, we were going nuclear. And I've run every combination, including even on my largest offset at 110 gallons, the Huron Gen 2. And whether it be Jeremy's method with three logs on the bottom and then one, two, or three on top, depending on what he's after, or if I go with the Jerby method with two on the bottom and three tightly stacked for that knockdown fire, there's no way to not be at four to 500 degrees in any of the four that I own. And so while this method I'm sure works fantastic 
for Jeremy and Jerby on the offsets that they have, these setups and approach just don't translate to different common backyard offsets. And this is even true. I've seen Jeremy in one of his videos where he went to a small cheap uh, offset smoker and he was uh, struggling to get that fire going and dumped a bunch of unlit charcoal on it only to find uh, as what I do in my Kamado Joe's if I want to cool them down is I dump uh, some extra charcoal. It brings the temperature really down and in a matter of seconds uh, you can see his fires out and he's working at trying to resuscitate that back to life. These smaller offsets are hard and if you mastered you know a 500 or a thousand gallon and you jump to something like uh, what I have the Oklahoma Joe's you might be surprised at just how much more difficult it is to pull off that nice clean smoke that you are used to. So I commend you if you're following along on any variety of a smaller less expensive backyard offset with thinner gauge steel no insulated uh, firebox and a smaller cook chamber in terms of um, managing how much smoke can build up before we start to get exhaust venting problems and a smaller chimney uh, my hat is off to you and if you're worried I've had an experience on a small backyard offset smoker and it was terrible and I don't know if I want to spend the money to get something larger just let me reassure you that life gets much better in terms of offset fire management the larger that you go not only is it easier to maintain a nice clean fire you can throw in more sticks but we also go from a spiky line if I show you a chart here uh, from a previous video uh, where you see like short little spikes and short duration burns where the wood combust uh, and then quickly starts to die out we need to add more but as you get up into the 110 gallon you start working your way towards a flatter line and if we were to go all the way up uh, based on being a guest on a larger offset uh, 500 to 1000 gallon that line almost flattens right out so now that we've uh, tried four common fires let's do some modifications in terms of what was shared there's good principles like wood size uh, splits hydration, uh, managing airflow. Uh, but if we just copy and paste the exact same setup, as you saw, we're not getting the results that we after. So let me share how I've adapted some great advice to a common backyard size offset. So let's go with my preferred fires. Now this is on my 110 gallon Huron Generation 2, which is pretty close to what we ran in this with the Z fire, because we have a 28 inch firebox, we can get away with having a little bit more of an open flame without the risk of it being sucked into our air intake box. And so this will hold a nice steady temperature as well as give us nice clean smoke that I can get fairly aggressive with the damper. So I'll just wait here uh, real time so we can get a reading in terms of how long it takes these splits to catch. So that was under 30 seconds, we're ready to go. So let's record the great temperature now that this is going and see what type of uh, fire this is giving us in 110 gallons for temp. Because our Gen 2 Huron has a 28 inch firebox, I can get away with controlling the flames if they get a little bit too open by running the damper about half open. I left them all open today, so we're not mixing uh, variables, but you can see that that's running along just about 260, just over 250 on our temperature gauge there and our great probe is reading 268 and because of that distance of the 28 inch firebox if i come over and look straight down you can see there's no flames being pulled into our cook chamber there's plenty of distance uh, for them to hang out near the front side of our firebox door so we'll go check on our next pit Okay, this is our Carlisle Gen 2, which is 85 gallons and about a 24 inch firebox. So let me show you what I normally like to do here. I go with mostly the uh, Chud method in both of my Carlisles. So depending on the temperature of the fire, I would either go with one or two logs across just like so. So once again, I'll leave you here in a lapse time so you can just see uh, how long it takes for these logs to catch and give us nice clean combustion. And like, uh, you know the drill at this point, we'll go check out the great temperatures as well. So we're about 35 seconds to get to this point. I could probably just move that up a little bit more, give it a bit more air underneath, and that would have been even quicker, but that looks good now. Let's go check the temperature. Running about 275, 273 on the gauge. And again, cause we've got our fire all the way back towards the door. If you look straight down, we're not getting any of those flames licking into our cook chamber since we've still got enough distance to work with. Probably about a foot or so is about the distance to the flame 
if I was to reach down in there. Let's check our next one. Okay, this is Carlisle Gen 1 representing 60 gallons. So like the Gen 2, I end up burning a very similar fire in the two of them because I think the Generation 2 has that uh, flat top which acts as a bit of double semi-insulated firebox. So the efficiency is nearly identical on the two of those pits. And so I've built the exact same fire here, again, uh, with the stick angled this way so that uh, as I close the door, air can come in and get underneath the log versus being right up against the door like this and blocking that airflow. All right, just like Gen 2, that was about 35 to maybe max 40 seconds. Okay, just about 280-ish on the gauge. 274 according to our grate. Let's take a look inside our Carlisle Gen 1. So we've got that fire. We're down to a 24-inch firebox here. So we've got that right against the door, doing what we can to make sure that when we look into our cook chamber that we're not getting any flames being drafted in. We definitely have to mine that a lot more than you do if you have a larger firebox and you can get away with a, a little bit of a raging fire. Again, if we wanted to control that a little bit more, I wouldn't be cooking or doing this demo with the vent all the way open, as again, going to about the halfway mark would completely solve any of those flames being licked into the cook chamber. Let's check our next pit. Okay, in our Oklahoma Joe's, the only exception to the rule here is instead of using a full size split, I find I get the best results cutting those down in half as my log rolls out the fire door here. And so after that's burnt down, I like to just place another one on the side of the semi-insulated firebox I built. It's cost me under $30 and it helps give some great heat retention to the Oklahoma Joes. And I like to just try and time it before this log is completely consumed and gone. That's when I add the next split. So that's about an every 15 or 20 minute interval. Just wait for those two to catch. Okay, in about 45 seconds, those look good. Let's check the temp at the grid level. Okay, seeing about just over 250 on the gauge, just under 250 on the digital gauge. And as you can see, uh, again, as we get even closer, this is where we do have to be really careful to mind that fire drafting in. And on my Oklahoma Joe's, what I like to do is place a water pan right on the low position to help again, block some of those flames from being pulled in. So recap and standing on the shoulders of those uh, that have gone before and shared some great advice. Thank you for everything that you do for the community. But to summarize the adaptations that we've made in terms of translating some great advice to a backyard size uh, offset smoker, there's a couple things that uh, we'll go over in no particular order. First, get a great heat soak uh, fire going when you light your grill. I like to add uh, some of that charcoal and use a kiln dried wood to really shoot that temperature up. This just will shorten the time till we are cooking and getting nice clean smoke and rolling logs. Uh, it'll make it much, much easier than any other approach. In terms of if you're facing a smaller backyard offset, something like the Oklahoma Joes, you have a, a choice to make. We didn't spend too much time on it today, but there's kind of two paths. There's the charcoal and add wood for flavor. A little bit I referenced earlier uh, what Jeremy uh, was doing. And there's a couple other really popular videos on that. For me, I'm just pure uh, against that. I have plenty of charcoal grills that are burning charcoal for heat and trying to supplement wood for flavor. And if you put it side by side by an offset that's using wood for heat and wood for flavor, it just never holds a candle. So even on something like my Oklahoma Joe's, my preference is to try and get a nice clean wood only burning fire as that result versus the charcoal and wood combination I find infinitely better, even if it is a, a little bit more work uh, at first to figure out uh, your ratio in terms of how much wood to add. I think you should definitely do that. And to pull that off, that really comes down to making sure that we are using the right size split. So this is about twice the size that we need. So we need to get our miter saw and cut that down in half in order to maintain nice open flames. 
Second uh, topic that we covered is the fire setup. And you should, again, experiment with any of these others' recommendations and see if you get a different result. Just because I get a different result in my four backyard size offset smokers when it comes to fire management doesn't mean uh, that'll be exactly the same for you. But if I zero in on one of my favorite ones that I watched early on, uh, Jerby, there's just no way that I can pull off sort of that two log side by side with three on top for that knockdown fire. I can get what he shares, which will be a very long lasting fire so we don't need to be adding splits every 15 minutes. Instead, I can get over an hour before needing to interact with that fire. What the story doesn't tell you though, is if you were to data log that the entire time, we would be up to 500 degrees and slowly working our way back down to a target temperature. And so since I don't want to be in that big of a range of a window, this is just not a fire setup that works for me. Instead, I go with the one that Jervy said to avoid here, which was that sort of log cabin style, or if we went for the Z style or the Chud uh, TP style, where we get more open flame and then use my damper to knock that back down so we're not getting that drafting in. And so by having a more open flame, you can now start to use your damper uh, to control how much of that is drafting into your firebox rather than adding way too much BTU inside our firebox. And this is either going to be all fire and five, 600 degrees or all creosote and smoke. And we're not going to uh, get the temperatures that we want. The third uh, element of this, uh, once we got our fire set up, is to try and get it as close to the fire door as possible. And so this combination uh, sort of goes with the previous one of the type of fire that we build that promotes lots of airflow in and around the log and our coal base, uh, but as well as much distance as we can get, particularly in smaller offsets like my 60 gallon uh, Smoke North Carlisle Gen 1, because I don't have the real estate that I have here in my 28 inch firebox on my Gen 2 uh, Huron. And and so that is something that we want to give ourselves as much flexibility as possible to get our fire nice and close to the door and then use the damper to lock things down and help regulate that fire from pulling in. And all four of these, uh, I noticed the exact same thing. It is incredibly responsive. You start to play with your damper, you make an adjustment, you'll see an almost instantaneous response in terms of your fire. So just uh, make those adjustments, take a look at your fire, check it a couple times until you find out what range works for you. So while I make good on my promise to my wife to get some for sale signs up, be sure to check out this video uh, over here where I compare the offset fuel consumption. So I measured out the same amount and volume of wood, put all four of these through a bit of a fire management test just to compare fuel mileage and do you actually save money with some of the features uh, that you get on a premium backyard offset like thicker gauge steel, insulated or semi-insulated fireboxes versus a thinner gauge steel like on my Hokoma Joe. So if you haven't seen that, you want to check that out. That's it for today though. I'm James from Smoke Dad Barbecue signing off. And remember, don't be afraid to fire it up.